So here's my first question for you, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, amongst your many accomplishments, one of the first, one of the most noteworthy things is a former president of the American Civil Liberties Union. The ACLU uh, defines itself as defending the, um, de protecting and defending people and, and ensuring the constitutional laws we live by are, are followed. Um, and so I, my first question I thought most appropriate for the audience is, would you tell us exactly what is a civil libertarian and how does that, what, what does it mean to be one? And how does that compare with other similar sounding terms like classical liberal, which economists fa often find themselves labeled as, modern liberals or just the unmodified libertarian? Okay, excellent question. So when I am asked, as I often am, to give a thumbnail sketch of the ACLU, I say that our mission is to neutrally defend, even-handedly defend all fundamental freedoms for all people. We believe that no matter who you are, whatever uh, personal characteristics you might have, whatever demographic pigeonhole society might want to put you into, whatever beliefs you have, religious beliefs, political beliefs, you name it, you are entitled to equal fundamental rights. And uh, we use, we are not the American constitutional law union note. We believe that there are certain fundamental freedoms that should be preserved from violation by anybody or any entity that is powerful enough to suppress those freedoms. As the constitutional law, those who have studied constitutional law here uh, will know, and my, I'm wearing my professor hat, I'm tempted to ask a question. <laughs> what is the state action doctrine? Okay. Um, the constitutional law students here would all know uh, that what many Americans don't, that the Constitution only protects you against rights violations by the government. And the ACLU believes that there are certain powerful private sector entities that are also capable of effectively violating your rights, such as um, employers, and we're talking on a large scale, employers, places of public accommodation, such as uh, hotels and restaurants, uh, housing institutions, all of these are not bound by the Constitution, which is why the ACLU has always lobbied for civil rights statutes that would prevent discrimination on the basis of race, religion, sexual orientation, and so forth. Um, in that sense, I think that we are different from libertarians. I, I'm not an expert, but I have many friends who call themselves libertarians, including at the Cato Institute. And I was recent, and we have a friendly banter because my understanding is that um, they are much more anti-regulation across the board than the ACLU is. So my friends at the Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute opposed the civil rights statutes that the ACLU lobbied for and continues to lobby for. Uh, we still don't, as many people know, we still don't have an anti-discrimination statute on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity at the national level. We're, we're still lobbying for one that's called uh, ENDA, uh, at least in employment. Uh, and my friends at the Cato Institute who very much believe in non-discrimination, but they think it should be accomplished through voluntary voluntary private sector action and pressure rather than through government regulation. So I was giving a titled lecture at the Cato Institute a few years ago and I looked up definitions of libertarian versus civil libertarian and I'm going to have to give you a trigger warning now. <laughs> there will be an allusion to something, a word that starts with S, so if that bothers you, now is your opportunity to leave. Uh, and I'm exercising my free speech rights by, by warning you. Um, so my favorite definition um, was a, a libertarian is somebody who supports, is economically conservative but socially liberal. In other words, a cheapskate who can't keep his pants zipped. <laughs> I told you that was, that was the trigger warning. Um, and uh, some of my friends use the word liberal-tarians to indicate that, like at Reason Magazine, they like to describe themselves that way. So I'd say there, there are gradations in the extent to which we distrust government to ever be able to protect our rights. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so one thing I picked up from looking through your resume of past work, right, is, is uh, 
your your willingness and interest in hitting on hot button topics of the day and and, and writing about them and jumping into those those controversies. One that one that I thought was interesting uh, in one of your past books was on pornography, defending pornography. There we go again. Yeah, well, <laughs> can't get so, away from this topic. Uh, I was hoping rather um, to kind of shortcut my reading, if you mm. could tell us a little bit about the argument, especially from a feminist perspective, right, of why would you want to defend pornography? Okay, and, and that was not my chosen title. <laughs> it is misleading, and one of the things that I learned, this was my first and, and so far only book that was published by a trade press, and they were deliberately trying to be provocative, and uh, the cover was, you know, shocking, flaming colors, uh, defending pornography, free, and the word pornography was, you know, and flamingo, um, free, the subtitle, Free Speech, Sex, and the Fight for Women's Rights. And one of my friends who had written a uh, similar works, but, you know, in law reviews with much duller titles, and she said, Gina Dean, couldn't they work the word orgasm in, too? Uh, but it was, and, I, and I, first-time authors don't have the right to choose the title, so it's misleading because I no more defend pornography than I defend Nazism or fascism or, for that matter, socialism or any other message that anybody is delivering. What I defend is the freedom for them to make their own choices about what message they will convey and to other people to make the freedom to make the choice whether they will avail themselves of that message or not do so. Uh, I was, and still am, very involved with a group of feminists who believe very strongly that it is especially important for those of us who are committed to women's rights, women's dignity, women's empowerment, and women's safety that we have to oppose censorship. And it was very uh, of the sexually oriented expression that another group of feminists has labeled pornography and defined as sexually oriented expression that is demeaning or degrading to women. Uh, their thesis being that it fuels discrimination and violence against women. Uh, so I, I worked, among others, with a group called Feminists for Free Expression. We decided we would be for something rather than against something. Uh, and we believe, based on history and current reality, that every censorial law, including anti-pornography laws, uh, including anti-pornography laws that were advocated by feminists, have been used to suppress speech that is especially important for women's rights, for reproductive freedom, for LGBT rights. And, and I can give you an example. Uh, the can, can, Canada's Supreme Court was persuaded to adopt the uh, concept of illegal pornography that was advocated most famously in this country by Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin. Uh, they did succeed in passing a couple of laws that defined and outlawed um, pornography as speech, that sexually oriented expression that was demeaning or degrading to women. Those were struck down uh, thanks to lawsuits that were brought by the ACLU and others. And by the way, the ACLU argued not only that those laws violated freedom of speech, but also that they violated concerns of gender equality. Uh, the ACLU submitted a brief, uh, let me see if I can remember the line, it was uh, a law that treats women like children and men like satyrs is hardly a step forward for gender equality. So Canada, Canada's Supreme Court was persuaded to incorporate that uh, concept of pornography that some feminists were advocating into its anti-obscenity laws, a very split decision. Uh, and sadly, all of the predictions that had been made by the anti-censorship feminists came to pass. Uh, the immediate victims were feminist bookstores, feminist works, including uh, works by Bell Hooks, Black Lives and Representations was confiscated at the border. I mean, this is a feminist um, gender equality, racial equality, sexual identity equality uh, advocacy, and yet that was seen 
by those who enforce the law as being demeaning and degrading. Uh, all of the LGBT bookstores in Canada at the time had their shelves swept bare, and you actually had police and prosecutors and judges saying that any depiction of LGBT sexuality was inherently demeaning and degrading. So, you know, I can sum it all up this way, Brian, that when you have such an inherently subjective standard as demeaning or degrading, it is handing over to the enforcing authorities this enormous discretionary power to pick and choose what violates their values and their standards. So the last thing we should want to do in a society that continues to be plagued by gender bias and by implicit unconscious bias on the basis of race and sexual orientation and other factors. The, and institutions, we've well documented that the criminal justice system and the civil justice system uh, unfortunately have systemic racism and, 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 and sexism. The last thing we should want to do is hand over to those enforcing officials and power structures this uh, enormous discretionary power. Predictably, it is not going to be used to advance causes that are dear to uh, crusaders for, for justice and equality. Thank you. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, let me switch topics a little bit, well, switch books. Uh, so as we heard from Dean Bowman, you have, a, you have a new book coming out called Hate. You love the nice, <laughs> nice starting titles, I see. Um, so now it's called Hate, uh, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. Um, so from what I understand in it, you advocate not for restrictions on free speech, mm. but for counter speech mm -hmm. as a way to deal with hate speech. Mm. So I was wondering if you first tell us what, what, it, what is wrong with censoring hateful speech. Mm. So what's the argument there? Mm. And also, what is it about uh, counter speech you think will be effective in dealing with this? Okay. So uh, first of all, every single word in that title is important. Hate, which is all caps because we obviously have such uh, spewing of hateful ideas and attitudes and actions and even violence. And it is a situation that really cries for constructive, effective response uh, at every level of society. I feel very, very strongly about that. Uh, and we must resist it. I am absolutely convinced, based on experience around the world and in the United States, that censorship not only is completely violative of the most fundamental free speech principles. And that freedom of speech is especially important for anybody who is marginalized or disempowered. So that includes the people who are uh, often targeted by hate speech. But I am also independently convinced that as a matter of policy and strategy, censorship does more harm than good. I, and there are so many examples. I already gave you an example from Canada, because when you think about it, that concept of illegal pornography that some feminists advocated was a specific type of hate speech, namely speech that was discriminatory or hateful on the basis of gender that was also uh, sexually explicit. And by the way, I, I do have to say this, Brian, uh, as all the law students, I'm sure, know, but not everybody here is a law student, hate speech is not a legal term of art. The Supreme Court has never defined a category of speech that it calls hate speech and says is excluded from First Amendment protection the way it has done with obscenity. In fact, the Supreme Court has many times, most recently this past June, when it unanimously said that our Constitution protects freedom for hateful ideas and ideas that we hate. Uh, and I, I can just tell you the facts of that case as a, to illustrate why censorship is the wrong way to go. And again, it comes back to this uh, notion of subjectivity and what one person sees as hate speech, somebody else sees as cherished speech or indeed anti-hate speech. So this case involved an Asian-American rock band called The Slants. 
And guess what? Simon Tam, who was the lead singer for that band, and his fellow band members, they were all guys, uh, chose this name deliberately to remove the sting from it, to reappropriate it, uh, the way some lesbian activists reclaimed the term dyke, uh, and others have reclaimed the term queer, uh, as a, a vehicle for empowerment to counter discrimination and disparagement. And uh, yet the United States Patent and Trade Office had this uh, absolutely um, general rule that if we consider the term to be disparaging, subjectively, we're not going to allow you to use it. And in fact, I, I gave this other example. Um, a group called Dykes on Bikes was initially also denied the right to uh, use that trade name. They contested it, and, and they also won. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, I so didn't get to answer the counter speech, but we can, we can come Please. back to that later. Yeah, sure. well, so, tell us about okay. tell us what is counter speech. So, so counter speech is, is you know, more speech rather than less. And it's any speech that in any way opposes the or counters the message that you disagree with. So, and the United States Supreme Court has endorsed that approach. Uh, they've said for any speech that you disagree with, if it does not pose a clear and present danger of an emergency, you know, directly causing specific imminent serious harm, then we have to oppose it through education, through law enforcement, through talking back, uh, rather than repression. So with respect to hate speech, there are many kinds of counter speech that all of us should engage in and that uh, we fortunately have seen so many examples. So after Charlottesville, think of the outpouring of counter speech um, condemning the messages of the alt-right white supremacists, conveying support for those they were disparaging through hate speech, reaching out to some people who were potentially being recruited for hate groups to try to persuade them not to join those groups or even to wean them away, as has happened in a heartening uh, number of instances, um, providing general education about a pro ongoing problems of discrimination and violence. And we saw, I think it was unprecedented that we had military leaders uh, condemning the hatred. We had business leaders, including those that were working with the president, um, condemn the hatred at a community level spontaneously all over the country. Community groups banded together. And interestingly enough, in Europe, where they have been censoring hate speech for several decades now, human rights activists and lawyers are saying that has not worked. We think that we should go more in the direction of the United States. And, uh, you know, correlation doesn't prove causation, but if you don't even have correlation between strict enforcement of hate speech laws and a reduction in discrimination and ra racist violence, that shows that, you know, those laws are not working. So think of Germany. It has some of the strictest hate speech laws in the world. Uh, I could just, you know, to give you, I could give you examples of very serious, what we would consider serious political speech that's been treated as hate speech. So very, very strict laws. And yet in the last national elections, the, uh, an explicitly racist neo-Nazi party got almost 13% of the vote. Okay. Well, so, uh, so to throw a, an alternative argument, right? So imagine, uh, so people who are arguing for restricted speech might co come through with the argument saying, well, that you have the speech is causing harm to individuals, and therefore through the counter speech, you're putting this extra burden on them that then now they're responsible for defending themselves going through the time, effort, organization to, to do that. Uh, wouldn't there be some potential value then in restrictions that save them from having to do that? First of all, we cannot assume that any speech causes harm, right? Um, and it's so interesting. Social, well, let me say this. 
obviously, a speech can cause harm no matter who we are. Probably all, many of us have been subjected to hate speech of various sorts. I certainly have been subjected to anti-Semitic and misogynistic and anti-civil libertarian uh, hate speech. Let's not forget that. Uh, and, and all of us know, you know, words can break our hearts. They can wound our pride. They can hurt our feelings. They, they are very powerful. Uh, but the reason why our Constitution and our culture singles out freedom of speech for special protection is not only that the speech is, is so powerful and to do a lot of positive as well as negative, but also it does not directly cause harm in almost all situations because it requires the intermediating processing of the human mind. And social psychologists, as well as political activists and human rights activists, have said uh, that we can and must educate ourselves, and especially the most vulnerable and marginalized communities among us, to be resilient to encounter hateful ideas, not allowing them to affect you in a negative way, but galvanizing you, making you angry, um, making you want to organize. And uh, interestingly enough, this is, I think, what is happening on college campuses around the country when you look at surveys as well as anecdotal evidence. And there are very serious surveys that show that uh, especially minority students around the country are becoming so active in causes of racial justice and social justice. We also see an outpouring of activism in support of immigrants' rights and LGBT rights and, you know, and uh, um, rights of, of poor people. Uh, it's, for me, as an activist from the 60s and 70s generation, it's just wonderful to see this sense of empowerment, that we can raise our voices. We are not going to be silenced. To the contrary, uh, we are motivated by all of the hatred and, and discrimination and hate speech against all of those groups. And I should mention also the organizing against violence, sexual violence and sexual assault on campus. So uh, it seems as if students, including minority students, are becoming empowered. And we have to, now I do agree that college students by definition are relatively privileged. And I'm very, very concerned that uh, those who are the least privileged in terms of education and access to technology and communications, we as a society uh, have a responsibility, I believe, to give them the resources and the education so they can speak back. But that burden does not belong just to them. All of us, all of us who are committed to equality and diversity and inclusion have a responsibility to respond to, in the most constructive way we can, any hate speech uh, whenever we hear it. And I think that's especially incumbent on those of us who are defending the freedom of speech. We have a special responsibility to count, you know, we'll defend your right to say it, right? Defend, as Voltaire apparently did not say, but it's always attributed to him. I disagree with what you say, but I defend to the death your right to say it. So we will defend the right, but we will oppose what they are saying. And we will fight for uh, constructive measures such as anti-discrimination laws and uh, hate crimes laws that will do more to uh, foster inclusivity and fight discrimination than censorship ever could. Thank you, thank you. So you brought up, um, to follow up on that, you brought up college campuses mm -hmm. and, and the issue of free speech on a college campus. Since we're on one, I think that would be a relevant uh, next question. Um, and so I'm very thinking of an example like uh, so when you have controversial speakers, maybe partisan speakers like an Ann Coulter, right, mm -hmm. who uh, get, has her speech, uh, her talk on campus canceled um, because of a variety of fears of what would happen. Um, and then the response being that, well, that's not free speech, that's hate speech, and therefore uh, it's perfectly legitimate to cancel this. Well, I, so I'm curious what your views are about, like from the college perspective, of, a, of promoting speech on campus, even when it's unpopular. Okay, so first of all, um, uh, Brian is quoting uh, a couple prominent politicians, among others, who have repeatedly made this erroneous statement, 
hate speech is not free speech. From what I've already said, if I were in a constitutional law class, I'd say, this is a review question. What is wrong with that statement? Uh, there is no categorically unprotected category of hate speech. But uh, because the Supreme Court has said the bedrock principle of our free speech jurisprudence is what we lawyers call viewpoint neutrality. Government must remain neutral to all viewpoints and messages, no matter how odious uh, we may find them, even if the vast majority of the community hates the idea and considers it hateful, that is never a justification for censoring it. But what is a justification for censorship, as I alluded to earlier, is the clear and present danger concept. I prefer using the term the emergency concept because I think it captures the idea that if the only way to prevent direct harm is by suppressing the speech, then but only then may you do so. And sadly, a lot of hate speech incidents do satisfy that standard. Can, may I just give one example? Uh, so last May, on May 1st, Law Day, uh, uh, at American University, uh, they were installing Amazingly, the first African American student body president that they had ever had in their history, American University in Washington, D.C., a young woman named Taylor Dumpson. And that morning, distributed around the campus were six nooses with bananas in the nooses. And written on the bananas were the initial. Uh, initials of her sorority, which is a predominantly African-American sorority, and also the name of a gorilla in the Cincinnati Zoo who had been put to death after a child was killed, fell into the enclosure. And uh, that satisfies a particular subcategory of speech that meets the general emergency test. Again, law students will recognize this, uh, what the courts call a true threat or a genuine threat. When the, ex when the speaker means to instill a reasonable fear of harm to a particular individual or small group of individuals who is targeted. And that clearly satisfied that standard. Um, by the way, you know, in Charlottesville, I think you haven't asked about this, but I think, you know, a, a counter demonstrator or a demonstrator who's um, being encountered by people who are brandishing guns, that might very well satisfy the true threat standard. I mean, these are very fact specific. Um, situations. I would imagine going to Charlottesville, right? That, that's that's hard to anticipate beforehand, right? Like, um, so an organization like the ACLU, or what's the proper way forward would be to, from what you're arguing, protect that speech and allow them, and then promote people counter speaking against it. But then, what happens if someone then brings in their second <laughs> amendment rights and 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 then arms themselves with hateful speech, right? Uh, how do you anticipate? I like this that was a pun. That was a pun. <laughs> arms themselves. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, that's, yeah, we'll <laughs> so right. the the this, neither <laughs> the first amendment nor the second amendment is absolutely, in fact, no rights protections, with one exception that I can think of, are absolute. And again, I feel like putting on my con law professor hat and saying, what is the absolute, one absolute right? But that's to be answered later. Um, all of them have these limits when there is an emergency, when stopping uh, the exercise of the right is the only way to prevent some great harm that can't be pre uh, prevented in any way. And even in the Supreme Court's historic decision in which it upheld for the first time the right of individuals to bear arms under the Second Amendment, uh, it limited very carefully that the scope of that holding to particular purposes, to a particular setting, namely self-defense of the home. It said it didn't need to define whether the scope of the right even extended beyond that. And also, in Justice Scalia's majority opinion, he took pains to say there are many kinds of regulations that would be consistent uh, with, you know, even if the scope of the right goes beyond the home, just as the First Amendment is not without limits, the same is true of the Second Amendment. And one of the examples that he gave, interestingly enough, 
uh, was restrictions on uh, bearing guns in sensitive places. And he mentioned government buildings and schools, but it could certainly be that a public assembly where there are uh, vehemently contending demonstrators and counter demonstrators, that that could be seen to be a sensitive location where a regulation would be permissible. But I think, you know, again, consistent with the ACLU's view and what the government should be trying to do, namely to maximally protect all freedoms for all people. We should, you know, to the maximum extent, protect the right to bear arms as long as it is not interfering with freedom of speech. And the concern about bearing guns in a demonstration is that it can be intimidating to those who are trying to express a different message from those who are bearing guns, which would mean not only violating their freedom of speech, maybe constituting a true threat, and maybe even deterring them from, from moving about in public because they have a, um, a reasonable fear that they might be subject to uh, a, an attack. Great. Great. So I have one last question for you. No. And, and so going this so one, fast. Yeah. So this one is... Um, because I'm an economist, and that's how I view things, right? So I'm I'll, married to an economist, so I know how it goes. <laughs> <Good> for you, <laughs> right? And he never, ba he never balances the checkbook. <laughs> uh, <laughs> me neither. Um, so, uh, so what I'm trying, to, uh, I'm reading through your writings, and I'm trying to think about, uh, trying to get my mind around your arguments before I have a chance mm -hmm. to meet you. And it, the way I was interpreting your broad arguments here is that what you're promoting is like a free entry into the marketplace of ideas, mm -hmm. right? That there are, people have different ideas, some are offensive and we may not like, and, and so, but, so the way to act is to get rid of restrictions and encourage full, full participation. And so then I thought about kind of the economics of regulation, right? And, and, that, and kind of the, the core problem I, I see that's universal, not just your topic, is that regulations tend to benefit some group of individuals and have dispersed cost mm -hmm. over others. Mm -hmm. And that makes it very difficult then to, for the, the dispersion of the cost to organize mm -hmm. uh, a, a, some kind of counter to that, right? So you can think of the uh, politicking, the lobbying world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so then it seems like the, the core dilemma then is given that we're talking about a regulation in, in here in speech where the cost of the restrictions are so spread out mm -hmm. what is the path forward how do we how do how do we promote this free entry into ideas when there might be those who have strong incentives to keep that from happening uh, it's it's such a great question and it's one that really applies to all civil liberties because most people are well, I, I can summarize the attitude by quoting the title of a book by a dear friend who, who died recently, Nat Hentoff, um, and it was called Freedom of Speech for Me, But Not for Thee. So the ACLU constantly had, and I want to thank the uh, local ACLU activists who are here, including the uh, newly revived chapter, I understand, at the law school here. Uh, but we will get so many people who say they would never join the ACLU because because they don't like the fact that we are defending rights for, oh, those, you know, KKK people or, you know, gay people or whatever they don't like, but they care very passionately about their own rights. So our mission, and it's a little bit hard because it's abstract, it's not concrete, but it goes back to one of the very first uh, points that I made, Brian, which is that we are never defending freedom for pornography or for Nazis or whatever it is. We are defending a principle which literally redounds to the benefit of every single person. So even if the immediate beneficiary in a particular case is message X, I can guarantee you that message not X is equally protected. And one of the silver linings to the cloud of seeing so many examples of censorship and other rights violations around the country and around the world is for every example of speech that you detest and, and say, you know, why are you defending free, uh, the principle of freedom uh, for that speech? I can say, but you know what? I can give you an example that is absolutely 
absolutely your core belief, where it was subject to repression on that same rationale. So probably the ACLU's most famous case uh, before Charlottesville was Skokie, which raised the very same issues. A group of neo-Nazis, uh, famously or infamously, in 1977, wanted to demonstrate in Skokie, Illinois, a town that has not only a large Jewish population, but many of whom were Holocaust survivors. And um, even die-hard free speech supporters, namely ACLU members, uh, resigned in droves. We lost 15% of our membership because people said, we support freedom of speech, but, and I remember one of my friends who was uh, the head of the National Coalition Against Censorship said, everybody has his or her Skokie. You know, the one exception you want to make for what you consider to be the most loathsome speech, and you add it all up and there's no free speech left. But anyway, in the ACLU's brief in that case, um, so the argument was, well, why should the Nazis be able to choose a location where their views are going to be especially upsetting, especially offensive, especially provocative. And we, in our brief, we pointed out that that was exactly the same argument that had been made 10 years earlier when Martin Luther King wanted to lead a pro-civil rights demonstration in Cicero, Illinois, same state, interestingly enough, uh, with a very segregated uh, white um, uh, dominant community that was very hostile to his message, hated his message, thought it was offensive, thought it was dangerous. So, you know, I can always, and, and let me give you um, one example from France. I mentioned Germany. France also has extremely strong hate speech laws. And uh, most, uh, one of the most recent examples was the head of an LGBT rights organization uh, was fined enormously. I mean, the euro is worth more than the dollar, right? And it was like $15,000 for somebody who's basically a public interest advocate. Uh, why? Because she called the head of a traditional family values organization that was campaigning against same-sex marriage, uh, the head of the LGBT rights organization, called that other woman a homophobe, and that was deemed to be not, not only punishable hate speech, but a crime. At least she didn't go to prison, but she had to pay a 15,000 euro fine. Great. Well... First, Nadine, thank you very much for coming. I hope the audience join me in, in thanking Nadine for it. Oh, thank you for your excellent questions. And again, thank you to the Institute for Humane Studies and the Templeton Foundation for the funding. We do have some a uh, few minutes for some question and answer from the audience. Uh, if you have a question, we have a microphone set up in the middle there so we don't have to pass it around and have people running around with microphones. So if you wouldn't mind setting up a line there, and uh, we'll take a few questions. Great. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense perfectly clear. I always feel that as a law professor, I can, I can ask questions of, no, of yeah, the audience. I call in the front row right here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, you talked about uh, exceptions for free speech in the case of potential violence and uh, in the specific ways that you mentioned. Uh, we have more and more, I feel like, uh, conservative speakers coming to campuses and uh, being sort of driven off. And uh, from what I see, a lot of the uh, the reason that universities are giving for, for for sort of like comporting to the demands that these speakers not be allowed. <clears throat> Excuse me, I gotta stand up. A little too tall for that. Uh, is that there is potential violence, uh, and I'm wondering how you parse. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, there may be violence at this event, you know, your example with the nooses and all that sort of stuff, with there are people who are, you know, saying that they will visit violence upon this, this event. Do you know what I mean? So basically, uh, it worries me that maybe with that definition, like you could just shut down any event by having someone say, well, we're going to be violent. So how do you parse the definitions or the, uh, you know, the sort of fine lines there and... How do you uh, justify to universities the cost? I think the Richard Spencer thing in Florida recently, they had to pay something like $600,000 in police uh, 
protection, you know, to try to make sure that things, that violence didn't erupt in such a way that people got hurt. So those two related questions. Uh, thank you. Do you mind telling me your name? Oh, I'm Kendall. Hi. Kendall, thank you for the, for the excellent question. Uh, so the Supreme Court correctly has said that a vague fear of potential danger that might materialize at some future time is never a justification for suppressing speech, right? Before the court adopted the emergency test, which it did as part of the civil rights movement, no coincidence, uh, because civil rights demonstrators were constantly confronted with hostile audiences, and local governments were constantly denying permits to or shutting down civil rights demonstrations on this rationale that you've got a hostile audience and they are threatening danger and we are afraid of danger. And the Supreme Court said, oh, so it, it, it reaffirmed the, this emergency test and rejected the prior test, which was the so-called bad tendency or harmful tendency. Uh, that was the test that the court used for the first, you know, until the 1960s, and it was the test under which all crusaders for social justice were repressed, including anti-war demonstrators and uh, agitators in favor of um, uh, contraceptive rights. It's why Margaret Sanger was constantly in prison. It's why uh, Eugene Debs was in prison. It's why communists and socialists and civil rights demonstrators, it's why Martin Luther King uh, wrote his famous letter from the Birmingham jail. Uh, so the court, because that, that was so vague, you know, as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, every idea, he said this in dissent, every idea is an incitement, right? Every idea could potentially at some point leave, lead somebody to engage in some illegal or violent conduct. So the court has said there has to be this tight and direct causal connection. You have to have a specific imminent danger of harm. And short of that, the government has, and if it's a university, public university, uh, the university officials have an affirmative responsibility to prevent the violence, to protect people against the violence. If the violence occurs, to break it up, and that they can only stop the speech as a last resort if there's absolutely no other way to prevent the violence. Uh, now, Kendall, you raise a really, to me, troubling issue, which is the financial one, because I know that the resources that Berkeley has said that it has had to pay, uh, and you know it's very well resourced, not every university can afford that. And what about small communities that uh, are having fiscal problems. Uh, I, that, to me, is a very troubling concern. But I'll tell you, uh, the Supreme Court has, has said that the, co that the costs of uh, providing security cannot be uh, tr transmitted to those who want to speak, because that becomes a form of viewpoint discrimination, right? The controversial speakers are the ones who are uh, going to have to bear more costs, and that, that's not fair. That means that their messages will not be heard. So I think it's something that we have to be creative about. I've, I've done some uh, discussion with some organizers who say, well, there are, there are kind of crowd control mechanisms. They sound unappealing to me, like barriers and barricades and pens, but it's much, it's much less restrictive than silencing the speaker altogether and could be kind of a, a way of accommodating genuine safety concerns and fiscal concerns with robust freedom of speech. Another question? Yeah, Professor Strauss and uh, Josh Hall, I direct the Center for Free Enterprise here, and uh, you know, thank you for coming. And in your talk, I think you've articulated historical reasons, legal reasons, pragmatic reasons for free speech. But it seems to me that underlying that is also a vision for what a free society looks like. And that's one where uh, certain values are held not because we're in fear, but because we believe them because of free and open debate. Um, if you had to say what informs your view about uh, civil liberties, 
you know, how much does that play a role relative to these very important historical details like the Martin Luther King example versus Skokie? It very, very much so, Josh. But I want to say the reason why I stress the adverse impacts of censorship on values such as equality and diversity and societal harmony is too often we hear that you have to make a trade-off. You have to choose liberty versus equality. You have to choose civil liberties versus civil rights. And I am equally passionately committed to all of them. And I believe, based on actual experience and history, that they are all mutually reinforcing. Uh, but ultimately, and, and I think it's even artificial to make a distinction. What is a concept of equality that would not include equal liberty for everybody? It's so interesting that when you look at historic movements for uh, rights causes, they have marched under the banner of freedom. So the civil rights movement, their banners said freedom. We know they were demonstrating for equality, but it was for equality in terms of, of, of liberty and, and fundamental freedoms. And uh, when the women's movement had its resurgence in the uh, late second half of the, of the 20th century, the phrase was used, women's liberation. And uh, so it was about equality, but I think everybody hungers for freedom. I see it. I've been talking about the US Constitution, but it's a universal value that you see celebrated and enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and regional human rights agreements and, um, and constitutions around the world. And it's humbling to me. Um, keep, I have in the past been very active in international human rights. Now I focus mostly domestically but we see people who are willing to sacrifice their, their lives and their physical liberty because they care, they hunger so deeply and so desperately for freedom of speech. I mean, a recent example was the Chinese human rights activist who died in prison fighting for freedom of speech. Great. Another question? Professor Strassen, I was wondering if you could touch on or give an opinion on the Citizens United ruling as a free speech case. Okay, and you're, you're Joseph, right? Correct. <laughs> okay, so uh, the Citizens United case is badly misunderstood and, and misdescribed, usually in the media, and I still defend the media's freedom of speech, uh, because it's usually described as campaign finance reform law that stops big, bad corporations from polluting the uh, political process and drowning out other people's voices. So uh, many people are surprised to learn that the law in question actually applied to all corporations, including not-for-profit corporations, including the ACLU. Uh, so the ACLU has actually been a plaintiff, as well. and it also applied to all unions, by the way, also usually not mentioned. Uh, the ACLU has actually been a plaintiff in challenging some of those restrictions because, the, and even though, uh, as a part of our own not nonprofit corporate charter, we never endorse any candidate or official. We are strictly nonpartisan as a matter of our own identity. But that law made it a crime to advocate for a policy issue if you mentioned the name of a candidate who was running for office and very severe penalties. I believe something like uh, five years in prison. So if the ACLU, and plus big fines. So if the ACLU, uh, after that law was passed, and I'm talking about the law that was struck down in Citizens United. Um, after that law was passed, if we continued to do what we had done before it was passed, which was to take out broadcast ads, we were mostly radio, we couldn't afford TV, but radio was covered, um, calling on, I believe it was President Bush at the time, uh, to, um, uh, to repeal the Patriot Act because that was violating people's rights, 
that would have been a federal crime because it was absolutely prohibited to mention the name of somebody who was running for election in the context of advocating a policy position. So, you know, most people don't know that that's what the law did, and, and I don't know too many people who think that that is a, a positive uh, benefit. When I told my husband that that's what the law did, and he said, I think, I think the ACLU should bring a test case. You should take out that. And I said, but honey, I would face five years in prison. Is that a price worth paying for freedom of speech? And he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, there are, there are deep problems with our campaign finance system, but as, as is often the case, I think that suppressing speech is, is ineffective and counterproductive to deal with the problems. Great, great. So I think we might have time for one more question. Let me do point out for the students uh, uh, in attendance, uh, there is a website link here on the giant screen behind me. Uh, it would be great to get your feedback. They'll evaluate you and how much they like your presentation. Uh, but also, let's just, because being pragmatic, uh, if a faculty member may have incentivized you to come here, this is your opportunity <laughs> to get full, all of your credit. So please, please go to that website and tell us what you think. But for the final question, please, sir. Yeah, thank you a lot. Joseph Cohen, I'm the director of the ACLU of West Virginia. Thank you for coming down here. It's been a great uh, presentation. Um, one issue we've been dealing with, free speech issue we've been dealing with a lot in West Virginia in the past six months, uh, year, it has been uh, free speech of public employees. So uh, some public employee, you know, with the uh, social media explosion may say something outrageous on Twitter, for example, uh, or may say something outrageous uh, in, during the course of their um, actions as, as a, 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 an in their employment uh, context. So trying to find the, the balance between when that is their freedom of speech that the government can't punish them for, and when that's really interfering with their ability to do their job uh, has been tricky. And it's particularly tricky for people who have, you know, strong, um, uh, they, they owe a great deal to society and public trust is, is vital to their work. So I'm talking about police officers and teachers in particular. And we've seen that a lot uh, recently coming up. And I can just be honest and say we, in the ACLU of West Virginia have struggled with that issue somewhat internally trying to find that balance. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, and, and thank you, Joseph, and thanks to all the other questioners. But before I answer the question, I'm going to make an observation, which is every single question was asked by a man. And that is a pattern that I see in my, and I don't know how to interpret that applause, maybe. <laughs> but I see it on campuses all over the country. And it used to be in the bad old days when women were such a small minority, uh, you could explain it that way, but now on many campuses, women are in the majority. I don't know if that's true here. And I, I was talking about freedom of speech. I wish that more women would exercise their freedom. But that said, I love the questions I'm getting from the guys. I just want to have more from the women. And that is, as you suggest, Joseph, a, it's one of these situations where we are trying to max Maximally respect all rights, which the examples that you give, a police officer or a school teacher certainly should not have to forfeit their individual rights, including freedom of speech, as the price of being a government employee. And, and we would say the same thing about the private sector too, right? Because some corporations have instituted policies that reach their long arm into the off-duty hours of their employees and, uh, and regulate. So you have to have some sphere in which you as a citizen, as an individual, can freely express yourself Right, that, that hunger for freedom that, that a prior questioner asked. And yet, and yet, you know, if you were my employee, I assume I was the uh, chair of the board of the ACLU of West Virginia, and you said something at a bar <laughs> that was inconsistent with civil liberties, that would be a little bit problematic, right? Uh, because you're such a prominent spokesperson for the organization. So I think you have to balance um, how that comment is going to be perceived. Is it going to be, would a reasonable observer see it as the person acting in his or her personal capacity? Uh, or is it going to cast doubt upon the trustworthiness of that person 
in um, carrying out civic responsibilities and government responsibilities. And so very painful decisions will, will have to be made. But I can tell you, you know, just one case, I remember the, uh, AC, the New York Civil Liberties Union defended the right, uh, very controversially, I mean, everything we do is controversial, but defended the right of an off-duty off firefighters to have a white supremacist type float in a community parade. And I honestly can't remember whether we won or lost that case because it was very painful and there were very strong, and, but, but one very, very essential fact was there was not even a shred of an allegation that these guys, they were guys, had ever engaged in any discriminatory on the job conduct, including no you know, disrespectful speech. They were exemplary officers in their capacity. They respected uh, equality and were not even charged with discrimination. So I'm, I'm just saying, yeah, it's hard. You got to hammer it out case by case. And thank you all for, for doing, doing that work. Uh, civil liberties only are as good as what happens at in every local community, including any campus. No matter how many big cases we might win at the Supreme Court, no matter how many great laws we might pass uh, in Washington, D.C., there are only words on a piece of paper, like the Constitution itself, unless there are people on the ground in every community that are aware of their rights, that are committed to their rights, that are willing to stand up and fight for their rights. So all of you who do that, you're my heroes, and thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to visit with you. All right, thank you. Thank you.